Welcome to our series on spiritual disciplines. Before we get into anything, the first question that we want to ask is, what is spiritual disciplines and why would we want to talk about them? The best way to think about the spiritual disciplines for those who are not familiar with them is exercises. These are exercises for your soul. We call them spiritual exercises. And they work the same way that a physical exercise would work. Okay, you do your physical exercise, you build up your body. You do your spiritual exercise, it builds up your spirit. Why do we want to talk about this? Well, why do we want to talk about exercising our body? Uh, because if you exercise wrongly, you can get hurt. You actually end up making your body weaker and less capable than it was. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're doing the right exercises in the right way so that you're actually achieving the results you want. Your body is actually uh, performing the way that you would like on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, the same thing with the spiritual exercises. You want to make sure that you're doing the right things, that you're doing them in the right way so that you are getting the results you want and your spirit is performing as you would like it to on a day-to-day -day basis. Another thing that we should say right at the outset is that uh, you don't exercise your spirit in a vacuum. Uh, so it's not as though these exercises are going to be unconnected from your body. Uh, just like your physical exercises are not unconnected from your uh, psychology, from your spiritual aspect. Uh, you are a body-soul unity, and whenever you exercise the one, some component of the other is going to be involved. And in the realm of spiritual disciplines especially, we really want to bring our bodies into line with the will of our renewed souls in Christ. Uh, so don't come into this expecting that things are going to be easy and comfortable all the time. Just like you shouldn't walk into a gym and think, oh, this is just going to be great and wonderful and there'll be no pain. No, uh, there's going to be some discomfort involved with some of these disciplines. There's going to be effort involved in these disciplines. There are going to be times that it's not going to be fun. And in the beginning, it can be quite difficult just as when you start exercising. It can be quite difficult. But if you stay with it, it will begin to get easier. Not only will it begin to get easier, but you'll start to see the results coming more quickly. You'll start to see them compounding. The benefits start to increase. It's like as you start exercising for a while, it's going to seem really slow. But then your body begins to get used to this. And you start seeing those gains coming a little quicker. Of course, there are places where you plateau, and that can be difficult. But the, the key virtue that we need to have going into this is perseverance. You have to have perseverance if we are going to discipline any part of ourselves and see any sort of benefit in it. So where do we start in disciplining our spirits? There are a number of places we could start, and I'm sure there are good uh, cases to be made in starting in different places. I like to start with the discipline of the word, and I think that I'm in good company here. I believe this is where Don Whitney starts in his book on the spiritual disciplines, uh, which is an excellent resource along with this course. Um, kind of expand on what I'm able to do here. And the reason that we want to start with the discipline of the word is because it's going to inform our understanding and our practice of every other discipline. Uh, so we might think of this as like working out the core of our body. And we want to build up those core muscles, uh, even if our goal is really to get big biceps or to build up our legs or something. We want a good core because that's going to be involved in supporting all of these other muscle groups we might be working. And so it is with the discipline of a word. This is going to inform and it's going to support everything else we do. The discipline of a word is also a good place to start because the discipline of a word, uh, the first exercise we do here is perhaps the easiest of all the spiritual disciplines. And that is simply hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God. 
turn to the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10. I'm actually going to start reading in verse 14 of Romans 10. And hear what the Apostle Paul says about hearing the word of God. How then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ. So here Paul says that hearing the word of God is foundational to the faith. This is how people uh, come to know and to call upon the name of the Lord. Some of us might have guessed and we might point to historical examples and say, well, this person, he had his conversion experience while he was reading the word of God. And that may be the case. Uh, but no matter when the moment occurs, in every example I'm aware of, there was a hearing of the word of God involved. It might have been earlier on, uh, it, it might have been the day before, but it's always a component there. And not only is it foundational at the beginning, but we can see throughout Scripture, it is clearly expected that we continue to hear the Word of God preached. Uh, how? Well, we can go to the example of the early church. As soon as the church gets started, what does it say they are doing? They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. So they're hearing the Word of God preached. They're hearing it taught by the apostles. Go to the pastoral epistles. What is the one skill an elder must possess? He has to be able to teach. Why? Because the people need to hear the word of God. They need to have someone standing up and reading out of the Bible and then saying this is what it meant. This is what it means. This is what God is saying here. That's why they have to study to show themselves an approved workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can go to 2 Peter, the end of chapter 3. Paul is making this great statement uh, that Timothy needs to devote himself to the gospel, the one that he had received from when he was a youth, and is able to make men wise unto salvation, because all scripture is God breathed and is profitable in every way to make men prepared for every good work. And then what does he say next? So devote yourself to the preaching of the word. Be ready in season and out. What is clearly expected is the primary work of the pastor, the elder, is the proclamation, the exposition of the word of God on a regular basis. Why? Because the people need to hear it. They need to hear it regularly. And so that is why we gather weekly, and that is why we make the sermon a center point of our gathering. God's word is greatly concerned with preaching. And it's, it should be the easiest of disciplines. All you have to do is go to church. All you have to do is show up at a faithful, Bible-believing, Bible-expositing church on Sunday and set yourself down in a pew and maintain some level of focus on what is being said. Now, we say here it is best to do this as part of a local congregation. We do realize there are some people out there that, for whatever reason, uh, they cannot get to a local congregation, a faithful congregation, on Sunday morning. Well, the Lord has greatly provided for this in our day and age. You can go online. You can turn on the TV in a lot of places. Uh, you can hear the word of God, you can hear it from some of the best expositors of the day and age. Uh, you can even hear it from some of the best expositors of days gone by. Uh, so if you can't get to a local congregation, you can certainly hear faithful preaching. Even if you are at a local congregation, you're hearing good preaching, you don't have to limit yourself just to that that one time of hearing the word of God. You don't have to be reliant on this one preacher performing week in and week out. Uh, you can avail yourself of other faithful preachers, and I hope uh, that the local pastor would encourage you to do that, to make use of the great riches God has poured out on you. Uh, I encourage my congregation 
often to listen to these other people uh, because there are things that they know that I don't know. There are things in the Word that God has given them great insight into that I don't have that same insight. Uh, hear the Word of God as much as you can from all kinds of faithful preachers. Uh, so go online and listen to Piper, listen to MacArthur, listen to Washer, listen to Sproul. Go back and listen to Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, you can even get some of Spurgeon's sermons being read to you. Listen to these things. Avail yourself of this. When you're listening, when you're listening, actually listen. Okay, so it's, it's not enough just to go to church and sit down in the pew and take a nap. Okay, if you take a nap during part of the sermon, you have not heard that sermon. You have not listened to that sermon. It's not enough just to listen to little snippets, little two-minute clips online. Now, those, those can be nice. But listen to the whole sermon and listen. Stay awake. Pay attention. Uh, make sure that, that you're actually hearing this. I know when I was listening to lectures in seminary, I would take notes. I never referred back to those notes. I don't know that I could read my own handwriting, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, but I kept the notes. Why? Because it kept me engaged with what the professor was saying. I heard it better and I retained it better even though I didn't go back and look at those notes. If that helps you, then, then do that. Take some notes. Discuss it afterwards with your family, with your friend, with whoever is there to talk about it with. Talk with the pastor about it. If you have a question, bring it up to him. Pastors love it when you ask them questions about the sermon. Uh, even if you disagree with them on something, because that tells us you were listening. And that's what we want, uh, because that's the discipline here is actually hearing and getting it inside of you. Well, we certainly wouldn't want to stop with just hearing the word of God. We also want to take it into ourselves, uh, right? We don't want to just trust what Pastor Jared is saying every Sunday morning. We want to go in ourselves and read the word of God to know, hey, is he, is he right on this? We want to be like the Bereans in Acts, right? Paul shows up and he's teaching them, but they're not just taking it at Paul's word. They're going into the scriptures and going, well, is Paul right about this? Is, do we have any questions we need to ask him? So we want to read the Bible for ourselves. And there are several ways we want to do this. We make the mistake a lot of times of thinking that reading the Bible is reading the Bible. Well, there are different levels of reading the Bible. Um, and when we talk about reading the Bible here, what I have in mind is simply reading the scriptures. And as Don Whitney says in his excellent book, this is kind of like skimming along the surface of a lake in a power boat. And you're seeing the broad contours. You're taking in a lot of the vista all at once. And this is good because Scripture is a unity. Um, all the parts are connected. And when you're moving across like this, you can see that connectivity a little more clearly. This is also a fairly light exercise. This is something you could do before bed as you're falling asleep. This is something you can do in the waiting room very easily. You don't have to have a lot of stuff in order to do this. You just have to be able to open the Word of God. So this can be accomplished in a number of ways. The main benefit, as I said, is you see the broader thing. You see the forest. We want to see that forest. When we get into reading the Bible, um, a lot of us get bogged down in, well, how much and how quickly and uh, schedules and these things. I think that those can become more of a hindrance oftentimes than a help. Um, they can they can become a hindrance to us in that we start getting caught up and well I need to make sure that I keep up with the schedule so I can read the Bible in a whole year. Hey, look, um, if you want to read the whole Bible in a year, that's certainly a great aspiration. But if it's more about getting through it in a year and it is about getting something out of it in that year and I think you've missed the point and you're not going to get a benefit. The Bible isn't a magical tome and just by opening it up and 
going through it in a certain amount of time, you get a benefit. The benefit is in actually reading it and taking into yourself what you's read, of actually being present in the Word and not caught up in schedules and making sure that you're regulating it correctly. Sometimes I like to just read through the whole Bible as quickly as possible so I can see the whole thing together. So I can take in the canon like one picture and I'll read through it and, and I think it usually takes me a week, a week and a half, maybe two weeks if there's a lot of things going on. And sometimes I'll just sit down, I'm going to read this book. You know, I'm in the waiting room. I know I'm going to be here for an hour. Well, I can read one of the Pauline epistles or I can read through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the time that I'm here. Or, uh, I'm going to go on this trip and while I'm on this trip in my spare moment, I'm going to try to read through this. So you can fit it in all kinds of places and it doesn't necessarily have to be just this one regiment uh, that you you keep through in order to achieve some goal. Now, if the regiment helps you, fine, but don't let it get in the way of actually reading the Bible. Now, we don't want to stop just skimming along the surface and seeing the big contours, seeing the forest. We also want to see the individual trees. And so we don't want to just read the Bible, but we also want to study the Bible. And this, I think, is where scheduled readings and uh, reading calendars and reading plans, they become more helpful because they'll help you to break up the Bible into portions that can be studied. And when we're studying, we move more slowly and carefully. We're kind of digging into it now. Um, study requires time and effort, and it makes use of many tools. So when you're studying, you probably want a few more things at your disposal than just your Bible. You may want a commentary that you can open. You may want a concordance to have open or a Bible dictionary. Uh, you probably want to have something there where you can take notes on what you're studying. Or you can come back to it later and you can see the connections between different places where you study and you can get into things. And if if you don't have all of your materials right there, you run out of time, you can make a note, I want to study what makarios means, and you can go back and get into that, or something comes up that you can't figure out, you can write it down and send it to your pastor, and he can give you some help, or at least point you in a direction to get some help. This reveals more of the details. When we study, we want to understand. Okay, so again, I say you don't want to meet a quota. You don't want to say to yourself, well, I need to study seven Bible verses this week. I'm going to do one verse a day. I don't think that's the best thing. It can help in breaking it up, but I would greatly prefer, what I tell my people, is stay on the verse until you feel like you've got that verse, until you feel like you've got everything out of that verse that you're going to get this time, and then move on. Uh, don't decide that you're finished with the verse before the verse is finished with you. I would far rather have someone understand a single verse of Scripture in a week than read a whole book. So understanding is where we really get the benefit out of this. It's not in being able to put on our Christian resume. He's studied all of these books. And it's when we understand it that we see the benefit. Well, we're reading the Bible, we're studying the Bible, we're hearing the Bible. Now we want the Bible to be in us. We're getting into the Bible, we want to get the Bible into us. I am afraid that Bible memorization is vastly underappreciated in our day and age because we have so many wonderful tools that allow us to get to the Bible wherever we are. We can put it on our phone, we can put it on our tablet, it's all over the internet. Um, and because of that, we might think, well, I don't need to memorize the Bible. That's wrong. That's wrong. Because no matter how many devices your Bible is on and how close that device is to you, it is not closer to where it is needed than 
actually being in your mind and in your heart. When the Bible is memorized, this gives the spirit that is within you more tools to work with when it's working on you. It gives you more to draw from in that moment of temptation. So even, even if you can't get to the phone, it's already there. Before you could get to your phone, the Bible is already in you. The Word of God is already in you, working against whatever is coming at you. Don't think that technology has lessened the value of memorizing the Word of God. Look, God knew there would be cell phones and tablets and the Internet and all of these wonderful things. He knew this was going to happen, and yet in His Word... He tells us to put it in our hearts. He shows us the benefit of having it in our hearts. It will never get closer to you than if you memorize it. This is, this is never going to go out of fashion. It's never going to go out of style in the church. At least we should pray that it doesn't because it's never going to use its, lose its utility. It is always going to be useful to us. When it comes to memorization, everybody works a little differently. So for some people, they can just brute force it, right? It just seems to come easily for you. They can just repeat over and over and over again, and after the 50th time or so, they've got it down. Uh, they, can, they can just work through it like that, and the repetitions will get it into them. Uh, there are others that you might need more help. Uh, maybe you're one of those that if you can make a picture, you can bring that picture to mind. That can remind you what the words are. Uh, song is very helpful. There are parts of scripture uh, that stay with me because they're set to a tune that I can't get out of my head if I wanted to. Uh, so we can use music to help our memory. More on that when we get to the discipline of singing. Uh, find something that works for you. Try different things and figure out what works for you. Uh, one of the things that I think is probably universal is uh, when you get in a situation and there's a scripture that God brings into you, whether you come across it in your reading or whether your pastor is preaching on it or you hear it, uh, from one of the other great teachers that you listen to. And it, it just means so much to you. It's so impactful in that one moment that it stays with you. Like You don't really have to try. You just somehow, uh, you get it. So John 15, 5 was like that for me. I heard Vance Pittman preach it one time. Really didn't interact with it much before that. But after that sermon, I... I knew it. I took it into myself and I memorized it and I don't remember even really trying, but there was something in that verse that I needed in that season of my life and continue to need, so it stays with me. The same thing with John 9, 3. Because of who I am, it didn't take much for me to get that verse into me because I needed it so much. And so there are some parts that are going to come easier for you than others. Uh, based on your life circumstances, what kind of season you're going through, what the Lord has uh, done with you. There are some things that will be easier than others. Memorization allows ready access to the words. So it makes sense the words that you are relying on most, the ones that you use the most, those are the ones that are going to be easiest to memorize. What should we memorize in the Bible? Most people will tell you as much as possible. I think that excellent advice. As much as possible. Where should you start? Well, you really can't go wrong uh, with the Bible. Right? All scripture is God breathes and is profitable. So it doesn't matter where you start. It's going to help sometime, somewhere, some way. I would say start with the parts that you find yourself going to the most. And start with the ones that you're always opening to these. I would also say when it comes to memorization, sometimes we can get caught up on the exact wording. If I need to memorize this exactly the way the KJV has it, or I need to memorize this exactly the way the NASB has it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you miss a word or two, 
as long as you get the essential meaning, as long as John 3.16 says something like, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. As long as you get the fundamental truths of that verse, as long as you get the details that matter, uh, then, then it doesn't matter if you say the only begotten Son or the only Son or I think even the Son would work. Make sure that you have it in you. Also, don't underestimate the value of having some of the stories with you. So, uh, the story of David and Goliath. Even if you don't remember all the exact words, even if you don't remember everybody's names, you don't, you don't know which of David's brothers are in the camp. You, you don't remember that David's father is Jesse who sends him to bring food. Just knowing the story and be able to recount the, the main plot points and to get the idea of it, that can be helpful. Okay, Noah and, and the ark. You don't know exactly how many cubits long the ark was. That's okay. As long as you get that God told Noah to build the ark and why he told him to build the ark and how things worked out with the ark, it, it doesn't matter really much to that story how big the ark was unless you're Ken Ham and you're trying to recreate the thing. But don't underestimate the value of memorizing when you don't have every little detail in these stories. Just having the narrative of the story can be very useful. That being said, the more that you can get, the more details you can have, the closer you can get to the actual wording, the better. Meditation. Some of you might think it's kind of odd to be talking about meditation. That's probably because you're thinking of an Eastern or a New Age idea of meditation where you try to empty your mind and become one with the universe, which is a terrible idea. Uh, but what we're talking about is exactly the opposite of that. We don't want to empty ourselves. We want to fill ourselves. And actually, that's what we've been doing up to this point is taking in the word of God, right? We've heard it. We've read it. We've studied it. We've even memorized it. So we've been taking it in. And now we actually want to absorb it. This is Don Whitney again. Meditation is absorption. So it's like you've just had a good meal. He's taken all of this in, and now you want to digest that to get the nutrients and the vitamins and the energy out of that food that you've taken in. And that's what we're doing when we meditate. We're trying to take in the Word of God. We've taken it in. We want to digest it. We want to derive the benefit out of it. We want to understand it and apply it. Look at Psalm 1. In Psalm 1, we see the righteous man. He's like a tree. He's like a tree planted by the streams of living water. Notice that he's planted by the streams of living water. That means he's always taking the living water into himself. And this tree is stable. It is not moving. The wind can blow all of it all at once. It is steady. And then it contrasts this with the one who is not righteous, who's like the chaff. The wind blows and it is just being blown all over the place. There's no stability there at all. What is it that makes this righteous one so stable? What is it that makes him strong in this way? Well, it's because he loves the Lord of God. That's the distinguishing feature, right? He loves the, uh, the law of God. How do we know that he loves the law of God? What does the psalmist bring out that this man does that shows that he loves the law of God that makes him strong uh, to withstand all the winds that are blowing around. Well, he doesn't say because he's always in church listening to good sermons. Uh, he doesn't say because he's reading the Word of God all the time. He doesn't say even because he studied the Word of God all the time. He doesn't even say because he has hidden the Word of God in his heart, which the psalmist will talk about in another song. He says because he meditates on it day and night. He meditates on it on it day and night. He is always thinking about it. He is thoughtful. This kind of meditation requires thoughtfulness. So we don't want to empty our minds. We want it to be full. We want our thoughts to be full of the Word of God, and we want to be full of thoughts about the Word of God. This is going to be difficult. 
it's going to be difficult at the beginning because more than likely we have not been taught how to do this. Okay, when it comes to listening, we were taught how to listen as children, hopefully. Hopefully we were taught how to read, we were taught how to study, and we were probably even taught how to memorize things as a child. And when it comes to meditation, not so many of us were really taught uh, this art of thoughtfulness, of concentrating on things and examining them in our mind. That's not as common. And so it's new to us, and just like as we start doing a new kind of exercise, it's a little harder at first because our body's never done that thing before, and it hasn't developed its systems to perform that particular motion or to encounter that particular kind of resistance. Uh, so too with the spiritual disciplines, if we haven't done it before, it's going to be a little harder in the beginning. And meditation remains hard. In fact, it might be the hardest discipline we've talked about so far going forward simply because we live in a world that actively works against meditation. There are so many distractions, things are moving so quickly, it can be difficult to find the time and the place. And so we really have to build up our abilities in this so that uh, we can perform in circumstances that are less than idea even. So we can take advantage of the time that we do have. And really, the psalmist says he's doing this day and night. In other words, he's doing this all the time. Uh, so we want to get so good at meditation, at keeping our thoughts full of the Word of God and being full of thoughts about the Word of God, that that's just always the way that we work. The first part of that is, of course, making sure that the Word of God is always in you, that we're always taking it in, right? The tree is planted by the living water. It's always drinking up there's living waters, and so we need to be in order to do this. But then we also need to learn how to control our thinking and what helps us in our thinking to really concentrate and focus. So for me, it helps me if I walk around. There's something about being in motion that that just seems to channel my thoughts more concisely seems to concentrate me a little more than if I'm sitting still. But for you, it might be better if you're sitting down and you might want to have things open because it's hard for you just to keep everything straight in your mind. So know yourself in this. Be aware of how you work, how your mind works, what helps you. And look for those things. Find ways to do this. It's all the disciplines. Find what works for you, okay? If you don't want to be trying to do your Bible study when you're falling asleep right after lunch, okay? If you're really sleepy after lunch, it's not the best time. Or you need to figure out what you can do so that you're not so tired if that's the only time that you have. Be aware of these things and do what helps you. Especially in meditation, because this is where all of these disciplines come together and we start to see the real benefit of them. Meditation leads to understanding, and understanding leads to application. So one of the things that I see in the ministry is we get these people and they're listening to good preaching, they're reading the Word of God, or even studying the Word of God and trying to memorize it, but they're still coming apart all the time. They're still having all of these problems. And they can tell you what the Word of God says, but there's some kind of disconnect between... They know what the Word of God says, but they don't understand how it applies to the situation. Somebody has to feed that to them. They're not able to do it by themselves. And even when you show them, a lot of times they're not able to maintain it. Why? Because they never learned how to meditate. Uh, they, they know what the Word of God says, but they don't really understand it. They don't appreciate it. And they haven't applied it to the situation. So they're not able to to look at what's going on around them and say, well, this thing is happening. Well, what does the Word of God say about this? Well, there's nothing in this reference table at the back of my Bible that has this specific thing, so I, I don't know what to do. I guess I'm on my own. Well, if you're meditating on the Word of God, you understand it. Now you're able to see applications uh, that aren't in that reference table. Now you're able uh, to 
derive principles out of Scripture, and from those principles you can get specific applications. So the, the problem was that these people were eating, they were being fed, they got the food, but they never really fully digested it. And so even though they were taking in, they were still malnourished and underdeveloped. You don't want to go through life that way. There's no way to live. You wouldn't want to go through life that way physically. I, I mean, we we all hate to see the pictures of undernourished people. It, it bothers us to see this. It bothers us to think about what if I was in that situation? We see all these terrible things that leads to, and yet in our spirit, we, we go about it oblivious of the fact that we are that emaciated child. We are the one that is malnourished. And it's not because there isn't plenty of food all around us. We just don't digest it. We don't take the time to digest it. We force it through our system before we've done anything with it. Is it any wonder that we're always coming apart and we're always stumbling and we're always confused? I don't think so. I don't think it is if we're not digesting what we're eating. So, we need to take the Word of God in. And once we've taken it in, we need to fully absorb it into our beings. Uh, we need to understand it. And we need to understand it in such a way that it starts to influence who we are. Uh, this is Romans 12 too, right? Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be like that piece of chaff blown around the wind, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's pray. Father, Lord, you have given us no shortage of good preaching. Lord, there's a lot of bad preaching out there, but there is also very good preaching. And there's there's so much access to good preaching. Even if we were to find ourselves in some little town where there wasn't even a church, let alone a good, solid church, uh, because of the Internet, as long as we have that, or even through mail, we can get good, solid, rich, biblical preaching. Lord, we can get your word. We can get it on our phone. We can get it on the internet, wherever we have that. There's copies littering hotel room drawers all across the nation. There are plenty of organizations that would give it to us for free. We have all of these tools to help us in studying it and understanding it. So many tools in helping us to memorize what it says. Lord, we even have help in meditation. Lord, we ought to make use of these things. And if we do not, we should not complain to you, saying that you have deprived us, for you have not. But we have failed to make use of what you have given. Lord, this is our failing, our sin. Please forgive us of this. Lord, help us in going forward to discipline our souls and to give thought to them and to care for them just as we would care for our bodies and for our minds, just as we exercise these other parts of our being. Let us also exercise our souls so that we should be ready for every good work, so that we should be like this tree planted by the living waters, that our lives would be a testimony of your glory and of the truth of your word in every way. Lord, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen.